Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Virginia Untold, Discovering Stories of Enslaved and Free Black Virginians. This is a program presented by the Loudoun County Public Library System. My name is Jeremy Worley, and I work in the program department of LCPL. Before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that we will have a question and answer period following the speaker's program. So feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of the screen at any time during the presentation to send me any questions or comments you have. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Lydia Neuroth has received her BA in history from UVA and her master's in library science from UNC. She currently is the project manager for Virginia Untold at the Library of Virginia, which provides digital access to records that document some of the lived experiences of enslaved and free black and multiracial people in the library's collections. So thank you for being here today, Lydia. We appreciate your time. Thanks for that introduction, Jeremy. Hello everyone. I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you all. Well, Jeremy gave a great introduction. I am going to be talking about Virginia Untold tonight. I'm going to explain the project um, a little bit about what's in the database, and then I'm going to uh, wrap up with a story or two um, of records that I have found specifically from Loudoun County. Um, Jeremy actually just introduced what Virginia Untold is, but those of you that are unfamiliar with the project, we do uh, provide digital access to records that document um, enslaved and free black people from before the Civil War. Um, we tend to focus on that time frame, recognizing that the 1865 uh, barrier of the Civil War era is what's really challenging for many people that are researching their enslaved ancestors. Um, enslaved people were referred in the records as property and therefore are challenging to document and trace um, through the documentary record. Digitizing those records is, is one way of providing better access. So the project has actually been going on for several years. I'm relatively new. Um, we started in 2013, back when a lot of other the some of these other projects and databases around enslaved people were getting started. Um, one of those being the Unknown No Longer project um, from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Um, those records actually are now available through Virginia Untold. So we integrated with that database um, in 2019. So if you were to search records from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, um, you could find that through Virginia Untold. Um, I'm happy to point that out at some point if that comes up in the Q&A. But just to continue with the timeline, in February of 2020, we received the library received a grant from the National Archives to hire a project manager. So I am the first uh, project manager for the work, and I was tasked with doing two different things during my time as project manager. One of those was uh, processing and digitizing records from the Richmond City Hustings Court uh, from 1782 to 1860. Those records are actually currently on display in the library for Black History Month. Um, I selected just a sample of the court records that we found available and wanted to exhibit sort of the trends and patterns we were seeing in those court records. And then I'm also overseeing the digitization of our free Negro registers. And I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that later and point out how you all can access those registers um, because they are a wealth of, of information for free people of color um, we recently got a new website, which I will also be demonstrating in a few short slides. And then um, I'm now happy to say that we have secured funding for a project manager position. So I am now permanent, no longer grant funded as of May 2023, um, which is very exciting because it means that we get to move the work forward in a new way um, where we didn't in the past. We were constantly thinking about which grant we could get next to do which set of records, but we have a little bit more flexibility in thinking about what we can digitize from the library's collections. Because if I can emphasize anything enough, it's that there is so much we could digitize. We've only scratched the surface. Speaking of which, um, I think that it's important to kind of break down what is available through the Virginia Untold database. Uh, we kind of talk about it in an abstract sometimes, but I, I think that explaining the types of records that are available for searching is, is useful if you're doing research or if you're explaining it to someone. The records at the Library of Virginia are state records and local court records. Um, so we are the state repository for Virginia. 
We also happen to have um, various local court records here for, for different reasons, mostly for preservation. Most of the materials in the Virginia Untold database are local records. They're created at the local level of government. They are local county court documents, mainly loose papers. We do have some state records in Virginia Untold. Many of those complement the local records that we have. Um, so just created at two different levels of government, but they are um, government records in Virginia Untold. We, as you could probably imagine, have started with the documents that are here at the Library of Virginia. Uh, we've began digitizing things that are already in our collections, but it's important to consider that many local records are still held in courthouses across the state of Virginia. In some cases, it makes sense for us to digitize those, but in many cases, um, for example, Loudoun, they have a lot of resources to digitize records related to black history um, in their county, in the county government. If those things are digitized at the county level, um, we will just point to the access for them. We won't necessarily duplicate their efforts. And I'm gonna point out um, later how you can access materials that are um, available through the Loudoun County site the scope for the project in terms of dates um, really begins in 1670. Some of our oldest records are from um, northern neck localities and goes up until 1867. Again, recognizing that barrier to access for people that were enslaved. However, Virginia Untold might not always um, end at 1867. We've thought a lot about how important the Reconstruction era is in documenting newly freed individuals. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind. We have over 20 different record types um, available through the Virginia Untold website, and I'm going to explain what record types are in just a moment. I do want to point out, though, that the record types that we have chosen to include in Virginia Untold document a unique story of Black history. And so when I say that, I, I mean that we have been intentional in selecting the record types that exist because people, there were challenges to being black before the Civil War, it's challenges to being black throughout our history. For example, in 1806, the Virginia legislative um, body, the General, the General Assembly, required formerly enslaved people to leave the state of Virginia within 12 months after being emancipated. If you did not leave the state, and you were caught, you could be put on trial and sold back into slavery. Another option was to petition the state legislature for permission to remain. If you were granted that permission, you had to show your documentation with that permission. We call those documents petitions to remain for short, petitions to remain in the Commonwealth. That document exists because the state was challenging free black people and trying to vacate them from the state of Virginia based on a fear of a, a quickly growing free, bl free black population due to emancipation laws. Um, petitions to remain are gonna come up again later on. Um, just something I wanted to point out in terms of how we select document types for this project. And then finally, the process for getting documents into Virginia Untold um, often exists um, or begins with boxes like this uh, from the courthouse in these court bundles. And we have to do a fair amount of physical mending to get them back together, processing, putting them in boxes and folders, arranging them chronologically. We index all of our record types as well. Those go into spreadsheets that end up online. And then we digitize them, whether we send them out for digitization or digitize them here. It's a lengthy process. This also includes a crowdsource transcription process so that everything can be fully keyword searchable. I mentioned all of those steps just to make you aware of, of why we haven't done more. Uh, often we get questions about why we haven't done this locality or when we're gonna get to this set of records. And it really does um, uh, take a long time to get through those record sets. This is a listing of the record types currently available in Virginia Untold. Um, 
I think it's just a good visual to kind of see the types of records that we have available. They um, pertain to both enslaved people and free people of color. This URL here at the bottom of the page um, will actually take you out to a context document that we've created about each record type. It provides a little historic context around why the document exists, what legislative act of assembly um, corresponds to it, and a little bit about what you would find or information you might find in that document type. These slides, I think, will be available afterwards. And um, I'm also going to point out on the resource guide how to find this particular link. This is the website for Virginia Untold. Um, the URL here at the bottom of the page will take you to the Virginia Untold website. I am going to come back to this in just a moment. I just wanted to provide um, the URL here at the bottom of the page and also point out that this seven minute tutorial explains how to research within the database. So if you have questions or just want a quick brief overview of how to use that search functionality, this tutorial, which is available on the website, will demonstrate that. Okay, let's get a little bit into the demonstration piece of this evening's program. I want to point out the Virginia Untold Resource Guide, which essentially is all of the background information for the collection. A lot of it um, I have just explained, so I'm not going to spend too much time going through it, and I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for our stories this evening. Um, but I'll just briefly show you um, the various tabs that explain an overview of Virginia Untold. The record types link that I was explaining earlier is available here, um, and that will take you out to that context document. Search tips provides an overview of searching a static version of that tutorial, that video tutorial that I pointed out. The related resources tab is actually what I wanted to spend a little time with this evening. In fact, there are not many local records that we have digitized in Virginia Untold from Loudoun County. And that's because so many local records remain in the courthouse in Loudoun County um, because they have great preservation um, capacity. Um, so it makes sense to leave it there. They have done a really wonderful job of making their records around Black history available on their website. We have tried to point to other localities that have done this, Fauquier, Fairfax. I'm sure there's others. This is not comprehensive. It's just where we've started. So know that this could grow. Note that we have um, just other general databases linked here, as well as newspapers, research guides. This in particular, if you're doing research um, on your family history, I would definitely use this research guide. African American research at the Library of Virginia to 1870, and then specific sort of topics as well. Um, but taking us out to the Loudoun County site really briefly, this will come up later um, in one of the demonstrations I'm going to show you. Um, so it looks like that they have um, PDFs of their indexes, which is really nice, which means you can keyword, you can control F search them. And then they also have images of those documents. Um, so criminal papers are what we refer to as Commonwealth causes, just an example. Um, there they have one of their registers of free people of color from 1844 to 1861. And they actually point back to us as well, which is really nice that we are collaborating in this effort of making things available online. So just want to point that out to you. Um, if you are struggling, if you haven't seen the site before, um, you, you may be familiar with it already. Um, but getting back to our records themselves, I do want to take us to the Virginia Untold website and just demonstrate what it might look like to search for some Loudoun County materials. I definitely think that if you're looking for something specifically in a locality, it makes the most sense to start with an advanced search. Coverage refers to locality. That's just a word that we can't get rid of in our system. <laughs> but um, locality could mean county or city. Did I spell loud and right? I think I did. I always spell it wrong. 
so all I've done is just type in um, the county name here under coverage and press enter. And you'll see here the types of records that we've gotten on the left hand side, both of these legislative petitions and public claims are state records. So, like I said, we don't have a lot of local records here. These were created at the state level of government. They were at the library of Virginia, so we had easy access to them and we put them into the database. So, selecting a document here, um, let's actually scroll down to. This 1. Clicking on the document will take you out to um, what we call the metadata page with information. And again, this is explained in the tutorial, so I'm not going to spend too much time with it. But talk um, just clicking on available at Rosetta repository. That blue link takes you out to the original document. Which, as you can see, is in grayscale and a little challenging to read. But luckily, we have a transcription on the left side of the page here. We have crowdsourced transcribed many of our documents in Virginia Untold, not all of them, but many. So definitely look for that transcription when you're looking for a document. Another thing I'll just quickly point out is don't let the boundaries of the locality stop you from searching. So we actually have um, a decent amount of records from a neighboring county, Clark County. Certainly when you're searching for um, enslaved ancestors or doing research around enslaved and free people, consider movement patterns and the fact that people during that time did not consider county boundaries the way that we do today. So it makes a lot of sense to be looking in those surrounding counties. Um, there's a quite a few free Negro registrations, which are loose documents um, documenting the, the status of free people of color that are available within Clark County. Um, so just something I wanted to briefly point out about the availability of those items. Okay, I think that was those were the main things I wanted to point out on the Virginia Untold website. Again, um, there are resources for helping you to search and um, navigating some of those search features should you need help with that. I can also answer questions at the end, of course. I now want to speak a little bit about our um, free Negro register project or our um, registers of free people. Uh, we call them a couple different things. Um, these register books are the result of a 1793 act of assembly that required um, all of the clerks in the localities to register their free people of color. Um, these are black and multiracial individuals. They were referred to as mulatto. Um, often uh, people that were free before the Civil War, whether they were born free or emancipated. Um, the 1793 law was for towns and cities across Virginia, uh, and then it was extended to all counties in 1803. So in some of the cities and towns, you see these register books beginning in 1793. Others begin later um, in 1803. The clerks in each locality were required to record various details about free people. That could mean um, their, uh, their name, of course, um, their age, height, how they were emancipated um, by deed or will, who their former enslaver was, um, identifying marks and scars. Um, some clerks went so far as to record things such as their place of birth, the name of their mother, um, more uh, detailed features like eye color or hair color. So you can imagine that if you're doing genealogical research on an ancestor, an, ensla uh, an ancestor that was enslaved or freed, um, this is an incredible resource, especially if you're able to connect um, a place of emancipation to that person of, of color, um, that free person of color. So we definitely um, were considering these documents for uh, the Virginia Untold project. And we have now, I can say, um, digitized over 40 that were available in the Library of Virginia's collections. We are actively working with clerks around the state 
to digitize the registers that still exist at the county level and create um, digital images so that those can be online and available through Virginia Untold as well. In addition to providing rich genealogical data, the register books also really speak to the restrictions that Virginia is placing on black mobility. Um, things like the 1793 law and the 1806 law that I mentioned earlier are coming in the wake of a lot of emancipations of enslaved people, and this is contributing to a large black population within Virginia. Um, and you can see the sort of legal steps that Virginia is taking to control movement. Um, we know that the process of registration looked something like a free person of color coming into a courthouse and producing some sort of evidence that they are free. That can be a deed of emancipation. It can be a will, will document. Um, it could be the testimony of a uh, free white individual in the locality, kind of testifying that they know that person, how they were born, maybe a little bit about their character. Um, free people could also produce a registration from a previous locality. So we see this happening a lot. Somebody is moving from Dinwiddie to the county of, uh, to the city of Petersburg, excuse me, and they produce their old Dinwiddie County Register to the Petersburg clerk. The clerk takes down the information in his register book and he issues that free person um, a new register document from Petersburg City. Um, in addition to, so he recorded, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my train of thought there. Um, he recorded their name in the register book, produced a um, free paper, free Negro registration paper, and then that free person was required to carry that piece of paper with them at all times. If a free person was found without their registration papers, they could be jailed. And we see lots of evidence for this as well, especially in the more urban localities. Free people are being put in jail for a lack of having their registration papers on them. So it does make you consider um, sort of this term free person of color. What does it mean to really be free if you're required to prove your identity in every sort of situation that you're in? If you're ever at large, if you're ever out in the city, you're required to have this document on you. What's interesting for us is that these register books that we've digitized and are now adding to Virginia Untold match names of the free Negro certificates that we've already um, scanned and digitized for the Virginia Untold project. So I just pointed out some registration papers from Clark County. If we had the Clark County register book, it would be really interesting to see if those names match up. But this is happening for other localities like Petersburg, where we have already scanned many registration documents. This is important because um, building more sort of documents in the story of a person's life helps us to understand a fuller picture of them. So it's an exciting thing to match these sort of records together. And like I said, we are actively working with clerks around the state to um, get as many of these extant books available through Virginia Untold. The register books have been scanned, but they're not yet available on the Virginia Untold website. However, they are available on our transcription website from the page. And this URL is gonna be available on a slide I have at the end of the presentation. Um, but for now, it's right up here. And this will take you directly to um, all of the registers that we have scanned and put up on from the page. So they are alphabetical. And I'm gonna take us down to the Loudoun County page because Eric Larson, the archivist there, was um, so good as to share his images, their images, with us. So we now have those available for indexing. So here's the Loudoun County Free Negro Register from 1844 to 1861. Um, this site is great for access. It's also great if you wanna help us out with our indexing process. We are going through and extracting the details that are located in each of these register pages and dropping them into an indexing spreadsheet. Um, this is helpful for us because we contribute a lot of these data sets um, to the um, Virginia Open Data Portal, which is a data sharing site, 
and enslaved.org. So just a brief sort of plug for um, indexing our registers. Uh, perhaps you're a part of a genealogy group or um, you're a teacher, you know of teachers, students that want a little work with some old handwriting. I will say the Loudoun County clerk during this year was a little tough. Um, he has some rough handwriting, so something to be aware of for sure. All right, but now I really want to spend a little time pointing out um, just one of the many stories that I was able to, um, well, it really isn't much of a story yet. I've only scratched the surface of this, these particular individuals, um, but I am going to circle back to the petitions to remain record type that I was talking about earlier. Um, what I showed you earlier from the Loudoun County site um, were legislative petitions and legislative petitions can include all sorts of petitions that involve free black or enslaved people. Um, but they also include petitions to remain where free people of color, people that were um, formerly enslaved, but emancipated are petitioning the court. Um, the state legislature in this particular instance to remain in the state of Virginia with their free status. And you will see the various details in each of these document pages. They're anywhere from 3 to 10 pages long um, sort of documenting why they um, should get permission to remain in the state. And they are really in a situation of having to prove their reputation, um, their character. You'll see a lot of this language. Um, they typically include the signatures and sometimes even individual testimonies of white individuals that are vouching for them. That can mean their employment status, um, who their parents were, uh, again, just their character, or you see a lot of words like industrious. Um, so they're very interesting documents. Um, they also help us uh, kind of trace individuals as well in, in terms of knowing if they stayed in Virginia or not. Now, I mentioned earlier that these petitions to remain are the result of an 1806 Act of Assembly that required um, formerly emancipated people to um, leave the Commonwealth of Virginia within 12 months. And as you can see here, I pulled this directly from the Acts of Assembly um, where this was passed uh, and required people to um, leave the state. Of course, they could also petition that's not documented in this particular act, but we do know that people went through this very lengthy process of petitioning the state for their um, permission to remain. I just wanted to give you an example of um, one of the petitions to remain that I found um, pointing out sort of those character traits that they are um, speaking to. Richard Williams um, has probably had his lawyer or an attorney uh, sort of speak on his behalf and write this in his petition that he was distinguished for his truth, integrity, and fidelity to his master when he was enslaved. It points out the character of a perfectly honest man and a good citizen. Evan Williams is actually his son, but we see also um, his good character and we believe he deserves it. Um, so this is actually, this is probably written maybe by a lawyer, but it's supposed to be on the behalf of Richard Williams by um, these white citizens that are supporting Williams' petition to remain in the state. I want to close, though, by talking about um, the petition of Wilson Anderson, which is a little different. Um, the, the one I just read to you was of a uh, father and son, but Wilson Anderson is interesting because I actually found him in some other documents. Um, Wilson Anderson petitioned the court in December of 1847. Um, as you can see here, very difficult um, to read. Again, that grayscale. I'm going to show you a transcription in just a moment. But I wanted to point out um, his petition in particular because the second page that he included here has the names of 35 what seems to be all men. And we can assume that these are white men in the county of Loudoun that are vouching for 
Wilson Anderson, who apparently is honest, sober, and industrious of industrious character. Um, Wilson, in his other in other um, pages of his particular petition, it outlines that he was emancipated by the will of his late master, John Nixon of Loudoun County. So I was pointing out that these petitions to remain are helpful in terms of tracing individuals and knowing where they go or where they came from. So we now have um, uh, Wilson's enslaver's name. So if we wanted to look for papers that maybe correspond to John Nixon, we could do that and perhaps maybe there's information about Wilson's mother um, or other family members or just more about his story there. Um, what's interesting in this particular case of Wilson is that his wife and children are still enslaved. Previous to which period he has been married several, several years to a slave by whom he has a, had a family and children who are all now resi residing in the county of Loudoun, the property of Miss Martha Blinko. Is that maybe how I pronounce that? So now we also have information about Wilson's children, who they belong to, and his wife. We don't have names, but we have the name of another enslaver that we could possibly use to search. It's interesting that um, whoever is writing on behalf of Wilson Anderson is pointing out that he would love <laughs> to remain in the state of Virginia with his wife and children. This is often the case. This is typically written in these documents that these people who have been emancipated simply want to remain in the place they were most likely born, have lived their whole life, and have their family and community. It seems so simple that now that he has his freedom, he would not want to leave the state of Virginia and everything that he knows. Again, 35 gentlemen of Loudoun County um, that you saw on that earlier page testified to the sobriety, industry, and honesty of your petitioner. Um, so again, talking about those character traits and sort of justifying why Wilson belongs in Virginia or should re receive permission to remain. Um, just again, this is another section that his character is talked to and here are the names of those 35 men on the next page. Um, so, in some way, it's it's interesting that we don't always know how these free people of color are going about um, collecting these signatures. Um, is an attorney helping them? Are they um, tapping into their net their own networks? Um, there's still some kind of um, lack of clarity in in the process and how these documents were put together. Well, I asked myself if I could find out any more information about Wilson Anderson. Um, his petition is actually referred to the next court. Um, so that doesn't really help us much. We don't know based on this document alone, what happens to Wilson. But I thought to myself, um, Wilson is a free man. So there must be, he was emancipated. So there must be some record of his free status. Well. We, one could hope, right? Um, another caveat we should say is that documents don't exist for all sorts of reasons. Um, they were destroyed, they weren't taken down, but presumably we would want some record of Wilson's, Wilson Anderson's free status. So I went to the Loudoun County um, digitized uh, records page that I showed earlier and searched in the uh, PDF of the free register from 1844 to 1861. And look who I found. Wilson Anderson, a black male, 29 years old, gives me his certificate number if I wanted to go look up that free registration document, which Loudon also has. And I can confirm that this is the same individual because look who he is emancipated by. The same individual, spelled differently, of course, um, that is explained or documented in that petition to remain. We have physical characteristics for um, Wilson Anderson now, which is, is really interesting. It kind of adds a new layer to understanding him as a person. He was five feet, six and a half inches, 
dark brown color. Looks like he has a scar on his right forefinger and it's injured so that it forms a curve. So it really takes kind of an abstract document and paints a picture of a man that lived a real life and was fighting to remain with his family in Loudoun County in Virginia. I went and pulled up the original images of the register book, um, the register book, excuse me, um, and I found uh, the the very entry for Wilson. And this is actually, um, I believe that this is actually, I, f I figured out that this was documented. Wilson is um, registered as a free person before Looks like 1845, he petitions the court to remain. So that's kind of interesting that he goes through the registration process before he has petition. He actually has permission. Perhaps he had permission prior and he's asking the court again. There's all sorts of explanations for that. Um, but it's just neat to see it actually written out in the original document itself. And again, this now, this register book is available on the From the Page site. So. I pulled it from the Loudoun County site, but we have it available as well. Alrighty, I just wanted to wrap up with um, showing you the links for some of the things that I mentioned tonight. Um, the Virginia Open Data Portal is something that I didn't explain, but I was talking about the um, where we add some of our data sets and our indexes, um, and that can be accessed from this site here. If you are interested in large data sets for doing historic research, I would definitely recommend that particular site and checking it out. Our From the Page site can be accessed here. And then following us on social media is a great idea. Um, we try to provide updates there. You will find updates about our blog, which I have regrettably not put on this particular screen, but can add a link to um, or drop a link to in the chat. I try to post monthly blog about um, various um, stories that I'm finding in the record. So if you enjoyed hearing a little bit about Wilson Anderson tonight, those are the types of things that I blog about, um, just so people can get a sense of the types of information that you can find within Virginia Untold and, and how we're putting stories together. So that's a great way to follow us, and we provide updates on the um, Uncommonwealth blog as well. All right, I think that was all I had for this evening. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm I'm happy to spend a little time answering those since we do. I finished up a little earlier than expected. Yeah, so feel free to use the chat box. They'll come to me. I can ask them. Um, we did have one question about: Is there a rough estimate of how many documents are you know are in the libraries or in some of these local courthouses? Do you guys have an idea about that? Oh wow. Um, I could tell you we have digitized 18,000 records in Virginia Untold. The library has over a million items um, We in the library alone. So if, if you think about that, um, it's I, I couldn't really give you a percentage of what exists um, from the courthouses in the library versus in the in the courthouses around the state. That's a really hard number to nail down. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah, also it's... consider that all of the documents are not loose documents, so I showed you those register books. There's a lot of things like that in the courthouses still, deed books and minute books and order books, um, and those contain pages and pages of information. How long typically, if you if you find a document in a courthouse and it's, it's not in good condition, how long does it typically take for you to, let's say, reassemble a record that's maybe not in the best of condition? That's a good question. Um, if it's in really bad shape, we have a conservator on staff that will do a lot of work to it. Um, however, the kind of stuff that I'm mending back together for Virginia Untold is typically torn down the middle because it's been folded too many times or it's missing an ear, um, you know, that's been that's fallen off, and that takes me probably two minutes. <laughs> I got, Not too bad. I've, I've gotten pretty fast. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of little stuff that we can do in house, which is nice. Cool. We have another question. Um, how did the decision to crowdsource the transcription work take? Was it just just basically it, it was would take so many like so so many hands, so many people looking at it. That was a nice way to get the communities involved with with this important work. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So our crowdsourcing pro program began before my time, but I do know, I've learned from my colleagues that yes, it has definitely evolved. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I think that it was definitely an efficiency thing. Right. Um, you know, we were thinking, wow, we could, more hands on this would really help us. And um, it was popular and trending back when the Smithsonian started it and the National Archives. Um, but then we saw it as really a way to um, engage the public's point of view. So especially during our um, events like our transcribathons, we've built in a um, intentional time to discuss sort of the process of describe of um, transcribing these things. What stood out to people? Something that I think about a lot is that um, our field, um, the archives field, is primarily white, and we. Right come at these records with a certain perspective. And it's challenging for us to put ourselves in any other point of view. One of the ways, um, it's not the best way, but one way is by engaging the public through some of those programs and allowing them the opportunity to say, this is actually how I would read this. You know, this is what this made me think of. Um, it's just a small step and I, I wanna think about more ways we can do that, but um, transcription is one of them. I think that transcription is a, a very intimate um, sort of experience. You have to get really close with a document and really read those words on the page. And it's hard to walk away without having grasped, wow, they are dehumanizing someone there. Um, so I do think that that's a powerful tool. <laughs> It seemed like, you know, involving some of our high school students would be a great way to, you know, like reading something in a, in a textbook is one thing, but then when you, kind of being physically involved in, and, in, you know, helping other people access the material seems like it'd be an important, you know, part of just learning about our history. Absolutely. And the high schoolers I've worked with have blown me away. Um, right. They typically are really insightful um, and pick up on things. I think even the the, the handwriting itself is a barrier to access <laughs> yeah. at times. However, right. I've found that they really enjoy the process of puzzling through it um, and yeah. trying to tease it out. And then when they finally, you know, figure out what I, it says, it's it's like a small victory. Um, so yeah, I think that um, high schoolers are actually a, a really great audience for this kind of stuff. Ooh, okay, we had another question. Um, would you know the best way to track the ancestry from the free Negro papers through to current day ancestors? Okay, so you're asking. So I guess like, look, looking at Virginia and told finding the free Negro papers and then track tracking maybe like a family tree into yeah. a modern I, day. I would definitely try to use records from the Freedmen's Bureau, which are available through Ancestry.com and on the National Archives site. The Freedmen's Bureau papers, and we have some Freedmen's contracts in Virginia Untold, but those provide sort of like the link, I think in many cases, to showing who was, um, well, they talk about enslaved people, but they also talk about free people of color. Um, free people are a little easier to track because they're typically referred to with last names. I'll also mention that in addition to the free register, free tax records, are often a place where free people of color will show up. Those are digitized in Virginia Untold. Um, we've talked about petitions to remain um, free, loose free papers. Um, but the voter registration books that we also have in Virginia Untold, um, those are the 1867 uh, election books, or they go by a couple different names, um, poll books, um, not to be confused with poll tax, but um, those are some of the first times that um, black men show up in the documentary record after slavery. Um, so those are another kind of linking piece. But my real answer is that every case is specific. Um, so uh, it, it would be a matter of um, the locality, the records that survive for that particular locality, and I would actually suggest searching backwards the other way. So starting in the present day and working back. The the um the lady who asked the question said they're um Girl Scouts working on our silver award, trying to trace oh. families who founded the Grace Church in Loudoun County through to their family members that are still in our community, which that is great to hear. Like, wow. you know, 
cool. Yeah, so that that's it's amazing to hear that that you know these little girls are you know trying to track track their history through you know maybe Virginia Untold and yeah I commend you for that. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I would. Um, if you do think that they remained in Loudoun County, I would go to the courthouse and see if there are tax lists there um, that are available because I think the tax records could show you through several years um, if they remain if they show up in that county. Okay, and so we have one more question, and this is more for me. It says, has this presentation been recorded for those who weren't able to access today? Yes, it has. So we, uh, Lydia was uh, nice enough to allow us to record it, and so we will post it on the um, Loudoun County Public Library Online Program's YouTube channel. So hopefully in the next couple of days, we will get it posted for you. That way you can have all, all the access to um, the information she gave us and also the contact information. So. Yes, we will have that available. And so everyone else said thank you. So um, we appreciate your time, Lydia, and thank you for the important work you're doing about digitizing this, you know, our history so we can learn about it. So we appreciate the hard work you are doing. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Jeremy, and those at Loudoun County Public Libraries for inviting me. Um, I enjoyed the ability to dive into the records a little bit and speak with you guys tonight. So awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. Hopefully everyone has a good night. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, Lydia.